every year, in fairness, uh, we hear that things are getting worse. And in a way, I wonder if that creates a, a, a form of sort of dysfunctional apathy amongst the rest of us because it just feels so hopeless. I think that's a that's a fair point that there there can be this this apathy that's um that is caused because I do think that people. It's like I don't think scaring people into action like to totally works all the time. I think that there's so much that we can talk about as well as that. Like there is a lot that we can do, and I don't want anyone listening to give up hope or to think that like there is nothing to be done. And I think that that narrative only helps the fossil fuel companies and the very very small percentage of the global population who are profiting from climate breakdown. And that's a very small amount of people. Um, it's billionaires, it's the people who like own the, in these industrial companies that are causing this crisis. Um, whereas the majority of us, we can benefit so much if it's actually tackled in a way that centers justice and creates a better world for all of us. And there is so much that can be done about that. It's really within our like capacity to be able to do that. But for that to happen, it actually requires a lot of us to kind of go um, not beyond individual um, actions in the sense that like changing or lifestyle choices but actually being like how can we build power in our communities how can we come together in movements and collectives and really push for the changes that we really need to see so that's from our governments that might be from Rishi Sunak or your elected official but um also from um like our local councils or our community areas like we really need to be actively engaging in um in transformation because it's an active process it's interesting we were at anthropy um 20, uh, 22 uh, last week for a couple of days and, and you know, collective action seemed very much, com collective action and community action seemed to be very much, you know, the topic du jour, if you will. You know, it was a, a, a gathering to come up with ideas for the, the future of Britain. Um, do you see that, do you see collective action rather than, I mean, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of cops and very little uh, progress uh, and a lot of people feel that there's a lot of political grandstanding that goes on at these events and, and and very little real action taken you know I remember last year when we were in Glasgow you know there was incredible hope that things were going to change and there was full support from you know Boris Johnson and uh, and the government and here we are 27 with you know and we're on a highway to hell with our foot still on the 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 accelerator according to Antonio Guterres so do you think that we need to stop looking to the political classes and and therefore gather like COP for, for change to happen? I think that what we need to do is realise that sadly, like, there is a huge amount of um, change that does happen from the COP process still. And I say sadly just because that, that, doesn't, that doesn't have, like, a lot of input from normal people, to be honest. A lot of that is the fiscal class. Um, but at the same time, all the change doesn't happen here. And there is so much change that can happen elsewhere and outside. And I think that we can do, what I try and do is try and do like a bit of both. I'm not ignoring the COP process. I'm still trying to engage with it and impact it where possible to make sure also that, that different perspectives are present, that we are really challenging what we need to challenge, which is the fossil fuel industry, which is um, interests that compromise human rights. Um, but at the same time, realizing that this isn't the be all or end all, and there is so much pressure and change that can be made outside and on the streets or in our communities. Um, and I do really believe that the only thing that will save us, it won't be these big conferences, it will be collectives and movements of people, because those are those are who saved us in the past. I'm, I have Jamaican heritage, I was born in Jamaica, and my peoples would not have been liberated if it was not for like community organising and action and believing that um, a better world isn't guaranteed, but it's something that we um, demand and, and create and, and achieve ourselves if we join together in collective movements that's not something that's handed down from above it's something that's brought from from the ground up and so i want people to be empowered like with the power that we have to do that and it doesn't just come from these spaces i think we might have we might have lost ella um while we try and find her michaela are are, are you over in any way the sort of commitments that were made last year you know to phase down the use of coal you know one of the most polluting fossil fuels to stop deforestation by 2030 to cut methane emissions by 30 percent by 2030 and to submit yeah. new climate action plans to the un do, do you know if any of those things have actually happened so I think it's 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 difficult to um to see how much of those have actually been fully implemented but I think that we cannot um we can't ignore the significance of for example fossil fuels being included sadly for the first time um last year and what we're hoping is that we can build on that this year and that there can be more like more agreements made to a non-proliferation of fossil fuels which is really important the fossil fuel treaty is present here like really pushing for that um and i think that like we can't i think that people often say as if like cops have done nothing they haven't done nothing we would be in a much worse position now if we had not had these cops so they are important in that respect um but I think we just need to demand more from them um, and 
the agreements that were made last time, whilst there was some progress made, it wasn't enough. And, and we just need to push for even more this time. I'm interested in what you're saying about, you know, community and individual action. I've been asking listeners today to get in touch and, and tell me about the sort of changes they're making. Johnny got in touch earlier and said that he hadn't he's, he stopped buying new clothes, but that was mostly because he hated shopping. Um, but, but, but Fran has written in and said, We've cut our energy bills by about 50%, even with the increased prices, just turning things off, washing full loads on low temperature and short cycle, using smaller oven and less often, etc. Also, no cling film and no plastic bags, uh, wash out old ones. It's quite interesting to hear. Those are just sort of simple adjustments, aren't they, Michaela? Is that the sort of thing that you, you think perhaps a government strategy on advising people about would be a step in the right direction? I think definitely a step in the right direction, but I think it needs to go beyond that. It's like, how can our governments make it so that these things are the default choice? Like, why is it currently that the only choices available to most people are ones that are really harmful for the planet? Like, why is that the case? And that's not the fault of people making, of individual normal people making those choices. That's the fault of the fact that systems have allowed to be put in place that only, that make those the only options available. And so if you're talking about reducing energy bills, a huge thing that the UK government could do to be helping people reduce their energy bills and their energy usage would be just insulating people's homes and retrofitting them. Like that's so, so important, but it's not being prioritized as um, as something that like on their energy security kind of strategy, mm. like that instead they're pushing for more oil and gas, which doesn't actually help any normal people at all. Michaela, just finally, the former uh, US Vice President Al Gore said today that Africa could be a renewable superpower and that the dash for gas in Africa is a new form of colonization. Can, can you explain what's, what, what's being referred to there? Yeah, so um, currently we're seeing a lot of fossil fuel companies, a lot of them owned by, um, a lot of them owned or have their headquarters in countries in Europe or in the global north or in, in the US, are like trying to exploit as much as possible um, the gas and um, fossil fuel reserves that exist on the African continent. And how that is a new form of colonialism is that, and it's a current form of imperialism, is it's the, the same kind of format of, European powers, global north powers, exerting power and causing harm um, to create profit that gets held in global north is happening again um, with this kind of obsession with um, exploiting the fossil fuels there. We saw that um, the creation of this climate crisis comes from colonialism in many ways in the way that the UK literally sold Nigeria to Shell um, back in the colonial period. Um, and the exploitation of a lot of these fossil fuels happens in these, these countries that are previously colonized as well. Mm. Um, and instead of following that same kind of format, what we could do instead is allow for a huge amount of renewable potential on, on this continent, but also all over the world and allow for actually energy sovereignty. So communities can own their own energy um, and really be able to um, like have independence more rather than the same kind of colonial model, which is which I think we need to leave mm. far, far in the past.